Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, my name is Amy Lubick. I'm a policy analyst with Fraser Health. Um, this session, our seasonal readiness webinar for non-governmental organizations and community partners, uh, is one of my favorite um, engagement sessions of the year. So thanks for being with us. Um, we're doing this in collaboration with Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health. Uh, next slide, please. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are presented to you from today from the ancestral, unceded, and traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, Kakite, Kwantlen, Keitsi, Semiamu, Sawasan, Coquitlam, and Stolo Nations, as well as the Inklanakmuk peoples. Next slide, please. So for a quick overview of what we're gonna to cover today, uh, our objective today is to share seasonal readiness information on smoke, heat, and a bit on window falls, share the resources that we have, some ideas and promising practices, and answer any questions that you might have. We're gonna start with a bit of a Q&A and getting to know who's in the room, gonna move on to presentations um, by the health authorities from myself and my colleague, Megan Strait, who's the project coordinator and analyst from uh, Vancouver Coastal Health's climate change team. We also have special guests with us from BC Housing, Lee Greenius and Marikar Angeles and Holly Jones from Mosaic. And we're gonna finish with some Q&A. Next slide, please. Um, to start off with a little bit of housekeeping, um, this session will be closed captioned. So if that is helpful to you, it's down in the bottom of the, of the screen. The presentation will be recorded and shared. So if you do have some colleagues that weren't able to be with us today, um, we can still share that information with them. And the PowerPoint will also be shared at the end of the presentation with links to the resources. Next slide, please. So today we are gonna make sure that they, we get all of your questions answered. If we can't get them answered today, then we will uh, take them back and get those answers to you, but we will do our best to answer them in the session. There is a Q&A box and we ask because there are so many people with us that you do um, type your questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll be trying to answer those questions as we go. Um, next slide, thank you. And uh, we, as I mentioned, we wanna get to everybody's questions, but we do wanna um, prioritize answering those in the session that, that most people want to hear. So I, I think, uh, We've um, there is an uploading up voting excuse me um, function and so just if you like the the question please upvote it and we'll answer that as quickly as we can. Next slide, please. So to start us off uh, in a good way, we're going to ask you to type in the Q and A your name, affiliation, the territory you're calling from, and also your role in heat planning. Thanks so much, everybody. All right, and now we're gonna go on to um, some poll questions to get us started. Tell us a bit about yourselves. Uh, next slide, please. So the first question is, which municipality do you serve? And please select all that apply. Okay, um, our next poll question is, oh, sorry, next slide. Um, who does your organization primarily serve? And please select all that apply.
Thank you, everybody. Looks like we have a really good um, mix of, of folks and, and folks that serve different uh, populations. And you're already on to the third question, um, which is which languages are spoken by those who access your services? Um, so it looks like we do have um, folks from all over the region. It's, it's actually fairly even other than um, a lot of folks from, from Vancouver, which is great. Um, a lot of folks that serve um, seniors and people with disabilities and health conditions, people with mental illness, indigenous peoples, people who are marginally housed and newcomers. Fantastic, we really appreciate having you. And very multicultural and uh, multilingual. Um, so thank you all for, for answering those questions for us. It's really helpful. Uh, all those questions help us understand who is our audience and, and who we're trying to support as best we can. Next slide, please. Okay. So I think we'll go into our first presentation. We want to make sure that we have lots of time for questions. Um, so we're going to start with a presentation on preparing for heat and wildfire smoke season. Um, I'm going to be presenting along with my colleague, Megan. And we'd like to thank um, Dr. Sarah Henderson, Dr. Emily Newhouse, Dr. Michael Schwant, Dr. Prabhjit Barnes, Jasmine Chatra and Ryan Chan for all their support um, with content and also putting together this session and the, the slides. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start with lessons from uh, 2022 and also some updates. Um, a rundown of the BC HARS, which is the Heat Alert and Response System. Move on to heat vulnerable populations and spaces, messaging and actions and examples and wildfire smoke, and then go on to what resource we have to share today. Next slide, please. So here in the Lower Mainland, we often think that we live in a more temperate part of the country, but we're actually seeing longer periods of hotter days and it's projected to get uh, quite a bit more severe. Right now, we see about a handful of, of very hot days, even though we've seen some very dangerously hot days. Um, but by 2050, we're going to see a doubling of those days above 25 and approximately 12 times more days above 30 degrees, which is dangerously hot. Our warmest days are projected to get about four degrees higher. And we're also going to see an increase in wildfires, uh, smoke impacts, especially with the hotter and drier summers. And we are seeing changes in uh, rain patterns and precipitation patterns as well, which also can make it um, make us more prone to, to forest fires. Next slide, please. And so moving on to 20, uh, 2022 lessons and updates. Uh, next slide, please. So everyone is familiar with the 2021 heat dome. Um, but this is a graph from 2021 from the Fraser and Vancouver coastal health regions. And we did see um, a pro almost 400 more um, the fatalities due to extreme heat than we do in a normal year. And this is a graph of 2021. Um, last year, we did not see the same um, increase in mortality. We did see some, um, but it wasn't near what we saw in 2021. We did have a number of, of very hot uh, heat waves, though. Um, I, I like to believe that it's that some of this is due to our collective seasonal readiness that we've been doing. Um, however, you never know what's going to happen in the next year. So it's really important that we continue our our work together supporting those folks who are most vulnerable. Um, interestingly, in, in Vancouver, sorry, in Fraser Health Region, we did see more hospitalizations of folks who were younger last year to compare to the folks who were older. And we do think that might be um, indicative of either people working outside in extreme heat conditions or people exercising in extreme heat. So that's another um, population that we would like to think about. Uh, next slide, please. So as many of you know, the majority of people who were vulnerable during the heat dome and during heat waves aren't those who are connected to the healthcare system. So they're people who lived often alone in community. And so we want to acknowledge the important work that your organizations do. At the end of 2022, we wanted to reach out and find out about the experiences of NGOs in our regions. And we appreciate the 49 um, different organizations took the time to answer. So we'd like to share a few highlights of that survey with you now. Next slide, please. 
So firstly, the challenges that were um, overarching themes. We heard that staff and funds for overnight response were a challenge. Funding for overtime and planning as well as AC were a challenge as well as building upgrades. Uh, concern for staff safety in hot and smoky environments. Inconsistent and uncoordinated responses by local government or health, the health sector. Or difficulty reaching clients, those with no phones or staff capacity go door to door, uh, access to buildings and things like that. And next slide, please. Um, and it was wonderful to see the the actions that people took. There were some really innovative. Um, there were some really innovative practices. There was a lot of education and outreach. Um, new, we saw a lot of organizations developing new heat plans. Um, taking uh, organizing transportation for vulnerable populations to cooler spaces or investing or renting in cool spaces or shading tents and misting stations. Um, heat check, heat wellness checks were um, a co consistent theme and we appreciate that. And some of the more interesting ones as well were handing out cold, cool meals to the populations. As we know during extreme heat events, um, turning on ovens and stoves uh, adds to the indoor heat. And next slide, please. And we also heard the supports that were needed. So year-round emergency weather response programs, public resources that are aligned and translated and accessible, um, and in more with more pictures and videos. And we really appreciate that feedback. That is something that we're trying to do, make sure that we do have a lot of translations of the resources that people need and also making more infographics and things that are easy, easily accessible. Um, heat and smoke plan templates came up as a need. Uh, funding, of course, uh, community maps with locations of cooling centers and transportation has come up as, an, as a, a concern as well. And I just wanna uh, highlight that where we don't have the capacity or um, the, the power to, to do some of the, to provide some of the supports that are requested, we do uh, do our best to uh, advocate for, for NGOs and the things that we're hearing uh, to other partners. Next slide, please. And so now we're going to go and do a quick uh, overview of the BC heat alert and response systems. Uh, next slide, please. So many of you might know, may know that um, we've actually had a local heat uh, response alert system for Vancouver Coastal and Fraser for the last few years. But it was really after the summer of 2021 that we there were significant changes and expansion. And in 2022, the province, uh, along with Environment Climate Change Canada and the BC CDC, created the first BC-wide um, HARS or Heat Alert Response System pilot. Um, very briefly, the current HARS has two levels: the heat warning and extreme heat emergency. Um, that was so that it was very clear when there's a lot of danger. Um, for the Fraser and Vancouver coastal regions, um, the the threshold for an extreme heat warning, or for a heat warning rather, is at least two days reaching 29 degrees and not dropping below 16 at night, as measured at YVR Airport, or temperatures reaching 33 in Abbotsford and not dropping below 17 at night. This is the level alert is considered very hot and is associated with about a 5% increase in mortality, and it happens about one to three times a year. Um, when this temperature threshold is reached and climbs for three days or more, this is considered an extreme heat emergency and is associated with approximately a 20% increase in mortality. And this probably happens one, or is projected to happen rather, one to two times per, uh, per decade. So when there are a heat warning or heat emergency, alerts go out through Environment and Climate Change Canada and we have developed standard messaging and recommendation for actions for a variety of partners, both before the season and during a heat event. Partners, are, partners include ministries, the health sector, local governments, Indigenous governments, as well as NGOs. And I encourage all folks on the call to look through the, the HARS document, which is available on the BC government website. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the the updates for this year. Um, BC HARS is no longer a pilot. Um, there are some potential uh, changes coming for the criteria after the third warning of the summer. So we, we do see tend to see um, more 
either acclimatization, acclimatization or people getting used to what they need to do for extreme heat events after the first couple. Um, and so we don't want to over alert uh, folks. At the same time, it's important to remember that a lot of the folks that we serve may be more vulnerable than the general population. So it's still important to do those heat check-ins and make sure that they have the resources that they need. Um, there's also new detailed maps for the environment climate change regions. And important, it's important to note the Sea to Sky region has been decoupled from Metro Vancouver for heat alerts uh, because it tends to have a lot more heat alerts than the rest of the, the rest of the area. Next slide, please. And so now we're going to go into who is most vulnerable to heat and why. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of folks are most are at risk of uh, heat-related illness because of their physiology. Um, in particular, older adults, uh, age 60 and older, um, as we age, our ability to cool our bodies down um, becomes compromised. And also, so does our ability to sense when we might be dehydrating or when we may be overheating. And so people can be in danger and not really know it. Um, people who live alone are also um, more at risk. They don't have people to check on them. And often if they don't go outside that often, no one knows to, to check on them. People with pre-existing health conditions, especially uh, heart disease, lung disease, and kidney disease, when the body's already working really hard to keep um, the systems going, heat can put those systems into overdrive. People with mental illness, and especially schizophrenia, um, we don't really understand quite yet why people who are um, who experience mental illness are more at risk, but we do know that we have seen, especially during the heat zone, more folks who are uh, dealing with schizophrenia uh, have hospitalizations. So if there are organizations that work with, with these populations, having a heat plan for those folks or having a check-in system is really important. It's also important to note that people who uh, are on certain substances, whether it's um, for a substance, uh, dependency or whether it's something uh, for a prescription, there are medications that can either make it more difficult for people to um, regulate their body temperature, sense when they're overheating, may make them more apt to overheat or more likely to get dehydrated. So it's important to know um, what our clients are, are using. And there will be a, a fact sheet coming out through the province of BC that will help provide some of this information. People with limited mobility are also um, a concern, especially if they can't leave a very hot place. Um, people experiencing homelessness or marginal housing, people who are working in hot environments, as I mentioned earlier, and people who are pregnant or infants and children. Uh, next slide, please. And so adding to, um, adding to physiological vulnerability, there's also social and environmental factors. In particular, people who are socially isolated, as we mentioned before, not leaving the home regularly, a lot of those folks are very, um, are very vulnerable. And often that overlaps with economic vulnerabilities, like not being able to afford air conditioning or cooling or other um, interventions. And also barriers to accessing help. So those who maybe don't feel comfortable going to uh, municipal cooling stations or feel like there is stigma towards them if they try to access those cooling stations. And often this is coupled with environmental factors. Again, lack of air conditioning is a big one. And we do recognize that air conditioning is expensive, so it's hard to, it can be a barrier for folks, but it is probably one of the um, most concrete interventions. Um, but a lot of the environmental factors also include buildings. So living in older buildings where there's a lot of concrete, no air conditioning, and there's not a lot of green space around can create the urban heat island effect where it traps the heat, uh, the concrete traps the heat, and it can make the temperatures um, of that area a lot higher than surrounding areas. And conversely, we saw during the heat dome that living in very green areas was protective. Next slide, please. And lastly, I just wanna to touch on the indoor versus outdoor environment. Um, generally, people don't die from the outdoor heat, it's the indoor heat. So this graph is showing the temperatures from houses in Abbotsford during the heat dome. It's showing the house without air conditioning in red, 
with air conditioning in blue and outside temperatures in black. And you can see that for those, um, the inside temperatures without air conditioning, temperatures get up to about 40 degrees inside um, and peak later on in the day as well. Um, you can also see that the temperatures without air conditioning don't dip back down during those high temperatures to a safe level um, for, the, for those very hot days and can actually remain elevated inside for a number of days after a heat event, even if the outside temperature has uh, cooled substantially. And of course, if folks have air conditioning, then that, um, then that um, danger isn't there. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna pass uh, it over to Megan for our next part of the presentation. Great, thanks, Amy. Uh, so we'll, next we'll be going through recommended actions from BC HARS and also in line with guidance from the health authorities. Obviously this is based on capacity and also funding um, permitted. So just a key, a few key highlights from the BC heat alert response system. As Amy mentioned, this outlines um, actions and messaging that um, partners at all levels can take. Um, so we want to try preseason to be creating plans, um, organizing um, collective responses in our communities, uh, trying to share information with those who might be at risk. Um, exploring options to put up a temporary cooling space or clean air space on site, uh, creating lists for cooling and cleaning air centers and spaces that you can share with your communities, and exploring potential options for transportation to cooling, and also trying to identify those who might be at risk um, and ways that they might need to be supported in the summer season. During a heat warning, we're encouraging folks to conduct community outreach, so focusing on high-risk populations who um, may be at higher risk and may be less aware of some of the risk, and also trying to share the local cooling center information um, and cooling resources, things like water um, sources in the city, um, places where there's shade and options to cool both inside and outside. During an extreme heat emergency, we're encouraging folks to engage in heat wellness checks. Um, as a reminder, these are things that can be done by folks without health training, um, we'll talk a little bit later about resources that are available to train people uh, to do heat wellness checks. We also want to increase community messaging uh, so people are aware of the dangers when an extreme heat emergency um, occurs. And we also want to consider expanding operational hours of temporary cooling spaces potentially overnight. Um, Amy mentioned how those uh, indoor temperatures can peak quite late um, compared to outdoor temperatures, so trying to have options for cooling even later into the evening. There is a more extensive um, information about recommended actions that's on the BC HARS website. Just a note here, um, we do continue to hear folks talking about challenges managing uh, COVID-19 in community, especially for folks that are uh, serving people who are higher at higher risk, so higher risk populations. Um, ideally, if infection protection prevention and control measures are in place, they shouldn't um, contradict uh, cooling measures. We really want to stress that extreme heat is a more immediate risk for most people and should be prioritized. Um, and if you're running into challenges where those are conflicting with IPAC um, protocols, please reach out to us and we're happy to consult on that. So we'll go through next some recommended messaging um, in alignment once again with BC HARS and um, the health guidance. Preseason, so times that we're in right now, um, we're really trying to keep it simple for the public. We want to encourage them to plan, assess their, their space, and also find a heat buddy. So planning is trying to think through what they're going to do um, you know, throughout the season, uh, looking at their space. Is it safe to stay there? Do they have options to move somewhere else? Is there modifications they can make to make sure it's safer? And finding a heat buddy that's reliable, someone that could maybe help with transportation, and who's able to check on them and support them during a heat event. Extreme heat, so these are the symptoms of heat exhaustion and heat stroke, which is the more um, extreme heat related illness. As a reminder for heat stroke, this is a medical emergency. So we wanna be encouraging folks to seek uh, medical attention as soon as possible, either at urgent care or calling 911. 
I'm not going to go through all of the signs and symptoms here, but please know that these are on the, both Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health Heat websites. Um, and as a reminder too, I'm sure as many of you folks know, um, a lot of the time staff aren't going to remember all these signs and symptoms. It can be helpful to have um, symptoms posted, you know, at the front desk where they might see people coming in from outside in a first aid kit, you know, in the um, their equipment packages if they're heading out with a kids camp. Uh, so trying to build some of these things in to just help um, if staff are encountering challenges during these heat events. Actions to cool people. Um, so we talk a lot about air conditioning and trying to cool us indoor spaces, and that's fantastic. There's also a lot of evidence-based um, ways to cool our bodies that are using um, everyday items that we have around the house. So I think it's helpful to chat about that as well. So if we're talking to people in community, they're aware, aware that there's steps that they can take to try to cool off. Things like seeking cooler spaces, whether that's indoors or outdoors, maybe a shaded park, or going into the basement. You know, is there a laundry room they can access in their building that's cooler during the day? Day. Uh, taking a cool shower, putting part of their body in cool water, even a foot bath is, effect is effective. And so for folks with mobility challenges, that might be something that's more accessible. Wearing wet clothing or applying damp towels to the skin to cool ourselves off. Drinking plenty of water and liquids, even if we're not thirsty. Amy mentioned that some folks, um, as they age, may be less aware that they're getting thirsty so we want it or if they have uh, toileting challenges for example they may avoid drinking because they don't want to have to get up to go to the bathroom so trying to encourage folks to continue to drink regularly throughout the day we also want to limit physical activity outdoors and also monitoring our indoor temperatures and checking on people who are at higher risk 26 degrees celsius is where we're starting to see uh, risk increase for people who are at higher risk and 31 degrees is where there's significant risk for people especially those who are at higher risk to heat um, so if it's over 31 consistently we are recommending that people try to go somewhere cooler and, and find somewhere that would be safer indoors actions to cool spaces. Um, obviously, air conditioning and heat pumps are fantastic. If you have those, we uh, hope that people are able to turn them on if they can afford to. Um, there's other ways to modify the space as well. So um, externally, trying to put up window shading and external window films. I have a neighbor actually that pulls, they have like those bamboo blinds that they pull down to block the sun from getting onto the windows. And there's another neighbor of mine that's gotten creative that has those tin foil cookie sheets they've put up um, on the outside. So lots of creative things you can do that way to block the sun from hitting our windows and heating up our space inside. Uh, we want to be closing our shades and windows uh, and our blinds from the inside as well to block the sun. So um, whether that's blackout blinds or even just trying to cover things up from the inside if you don't have window or outdoor access. Um, so putting tinfoil around cardboard, putting that up against the windows. We're also wanting to close the windows during the day. So 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. approximately. Um, and then opening those windows overnight to let cool air inside. Um, and this is a bit more of a longer term piece, but looking at trying to increase our site tree coverage, as Amy mentioned, uh, green space can have a cooling effect. Um, you know, and even short term, I've seen folks with those evergreens that they kind of put up around their balconies, so maybe trying to get creative that way, but a lot of these will be longer term. Just a note on fans, um, we often hear folks chatting about fans that they've, um, and I know growing up in BC that we, we grew up using fans, um, but new evidence is showing that fans provide a full sense of cooling, so a perception that you're cooling off um, when it's not actually effectively cooling your core body temperature, especially for folks that are at higher risk. Um, so we are recommending that fans are being used as a tool to cool your space, but not as your primary means to cool your body off, especially over 35 degrees Celsius. Um, fans can actually be counterproductive and, and heat our bodies up. So we're looking to use some of those other cooling methods that we talked before, and instead using fans to cool the space by uh, putting fans in the windows overnight to blow cool air inside and then kitchen and bathroom fans can also be used as a tool to move that hot air that's built up during the day outside because oftentimes they vent outdoors. Um, another piece that we're seeing is window falls in the summertime, especially as um, the heat's increasing in the summer and people have their windows open to let in fresh air. They can create a potential hazard for young children. 
falls from windows can lead to life altering injuries and even fatality. The risk of window falls is highest April through September, those hotter months, um, when children are more likely to be near open windows. Between 2016 and 2020, trauma centers across BC admitted 81 children after falling from windows or balconies. This number doesn't include um, the children that were admitted to other hospitals or children that weren't taken into hospital. Um, and just as a note here, it, it, we're looking at children who are under five as the highest risk for these window falls. Uh, the piece to remember around this is that window screens are not safety devices. They provide a false sense of safety um, and, or false sense of security. Most window falls happen from windows where window screens were properly installed. So it's not that they're you know, not being used effectively. Even if they are, children can very easily pop through them or fall um, or pop them out or fall through them. Um, so they should never be used to prevent falls. Uh, safety tips to prevent these window falls include keeping furniture away from windows so kids can't get up near windows. Um, and then also trying to install window guards or locks to prevent windows from opening more than 10 centimeters or four inches. And at the organizational level, all of us can um, work to improve awareness around this issue and educate staff and the public. We'll chat a bit about wildfire smoke. I know this is our, um, things that we're starting to see more often in our communities now, especially with climate change. Um, and we've had a number of questions around this, especially when we get heat and smoke together. So wildfire smoke is a mixture of different pollutants, which is dependent on what's being burned, where it's being burned, wind direction and sun exposure. Uh, it can include fine particulate matter like PM 2.5 and harmful gases like carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, VOCs you might have heard of before. Wildfire smoke can cause respiratory illnesses like cough or shortness of breath. It can also increase our risk for infections like pneumonia as well as asthma and COPD. PM 2.5 are tiny particles that are small enough to go into our lungs and our bloodstream. Um, and there's emerging evidence showing that long lasting effects of wildfire smoke um, can happen from multiple exposures or even just one season. For example, one study from Mats et al. estimated that Metro Vancouver experienced 100 acute premature deaths due to wildfire smoke PM 2.5 exposure from just two wildfire seasons. With climate change, wildfires are increasing in severity and number. More communities will be exposed to smoke in coming years, especially as wildfire smoke can travel hundreds of kilometers away from the fire and it can last anywhere between a few hours to a few weeks. So these are things that we're seeing um, happening more often and we want to start planning for um, and building these, um, these structures into place in our community so we're prepared. Some tools to help us better understand air quality and wildfire smoke. Um, the Air Quality Health Index is fantastic. It uses air pollution concentrations, both current and predicted for the next 36 hours into the future, to generate ratings from 1 to plus 10. These ratings are then based um, um, into categories of health risk from low to very high. And ratings are based on three air pollutants, so PM 2.5, which we talked about, as well as ozone and nitrogen dioxide. Each health category is accompanied by health messages for both at risk and the general populations. The AQHI is available online for 22 communities in BC, and we've added the link here to the slide, so you'll get that later on when we email those slides out. Uh, we also recommend that people check out the air quality advisories. So these are things that you can get emailed to you. You can also look up online. Depending on where you live, there's two different air quality advisories. If you're living within Metro Vancouver, there's Metro Vancouver air quality advisories. If you're living anywhere else in BC, you're wanting to look at the Smoky Skies Bulletin. Uh, so we'll have links for both of those in the resources for you to access later. We often get questions about uh, potentially competing priorities when there's both heat and smoke events. So we often think of trying to open those windows at night when it's hot out, but what happens if it's also smoky at the same time? Uh, the goal is ideally to have both cool, so air conditioned and clean HEPA filtered air. Um, if that's not possible, generally heat is the more immediate risk and cooling should be prioritized. Um, keep in mind that cool and clean air spaces can include existing places in the community with cool and filtered air, including malls, recreation centers, libraries, and faith-based centers. Clean air spaces can also be created by temporarily increasing the efficiency of filters within a building's ventilation system, or by using portable air cleaners or homemade air filters in a space. BC Center for Disease Control has some fantastic information around DIY air filters, and we have links for those in the resources. So we put together a number of resource slides uh, 
based on settings and populations. I'm not going to go into detail for every single resource, but I just want to go through the highlights of all the different categories that we have so you know um, which ones you may want to come back and take a look at later. First off, we do want to acknowledge that there needs to be more funding and better funding structures for the important work that NGOs do. Um, we continue to advocate up to the province and across to all of our partners, amplifying that community organizations are an essential part of community care. Um, so we, we continue to do that and we acknowledge that your work is extremely important. For 2023, we have a number of heat resources coming out. Uh, there's extreme heat guidance for restaurants, outdoor special events, outdoor workers, agricultural workers, like um, uh, that Amy had mentioned, cooling spaces, and then also some additional heat wellness check resources. WorkSafe BC is also updating their Beat the Heat guidance for staff. Here's a list of public and translated resources if you're looking for those, and it lists out all the languages that they're available. These are some of the main ones that we typically recommend to the public. Resources for wildfire smoke. So uh, BC, Center, BC Center for Disease Control is our main go-to. Uh, like I mentioned, there's information about DIY box fans, and they also have new guidance around wildfire smoke during extreme heat events. Weather resources, um, just a note with these that we do recommend Environment and Climate Change Canada because it's the official weather source uh, for Canada. The other piece with that is that um, Environment and Climate Change Canada are the weather sources that are used by all levels of government and emergency management professionals. So if we're trying to align um, and work on response together, I think it's helpful if we're all looking at the same notifications and weather that's coming through. Uh, there's a couple of options to access that. There's online alerts. You can also sign up for um, direct email alerts to your, um, to your account. And then also there's apps for your phone if you have a smartphone. For clients that you're working with that don't have access to the internet or a smartphone, there's also an automated telephone service. And then these are the uh, air quality advisory uh, options that I'd mentioned before. Heat wellness checks, these are ones that came out last year, a few resources. So uh, um, NCCEH has some information, um, especially for folks in community that are checking on family, friends, and neighbors. There's translations available. Uh, VCH also has the heat check-in support framework for organizations that are interested in engaging and conducting uh, heat wellness checks themselves. This year, we are coming out with train the trainer videos, um, an additional uh, training package. So if you're wanting to run your own in-service training to train your staff on heat heat wellness checks, we will have information for that. And it's hopefully going to be out by the end of May. There's resources here for building owners and operators, resources for heat planning and resilience. As a note with this, uh, VCH does have heat plan templates we developed for local governments. Um, please email us if you're interested in those. I think these are things that can also be easily adapted for community organizations. So if you're wanting a template to start with, if you're looking into doing heat planning, by all means, reach out. We're happy to work with you on that as well. There's resources for people using stub substances. Um, as a note here, Vancouver Area Network Drug Users Illicit Drinkers Group has some fantastic work they did last summer um, around peer-led um, uh, water fountain um, stewardship and then also mapping their community for cool spaces and cooling amenities like water fountains, um, cool spaces. Um, really awesome work. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out to them to get their report on this. Some cool ideas coming from Vancouver. There's also resources for people use, experiencing homelessness. And finally, resources for people who have health conditions. Um, I'll just note on the left here, this is a resource that we came across from um, Legacy for Airway Health with Vancouver Coastal Health. It's interesting, it comes based off of an asthma action plan. So for any folks in the room that have asthma, it's basically they go through different triggers um, and steps you should take. So what they've done is adapted this to heat and smoke. Um, so that AQHI that we mentioned, um, you can, they basically have taken that and then have individual health guidance um, for each level of air quality alert and then also for heat warning. So it's something that they think that can be used in community settings as well. So recommending the people that you work with access one of these and take it into their healthcare provider to help them create a more individualized plan for the summer. And finally, we're here to help. So um, both Vancouver Coastal Health and Fraser Health, um, we really encourage you to reach out to our teams for any supports that you're needing, both planning for and throughout the summer. Uh, we can provide health data, letters of support, free consultations, presentations and training. Um, really, we're happy to chat about anything that you might think will be helpful on your end. Our email addresses are here. 
And thanks. Um, we'll pass it back over to Amy. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, our next presentation is from BC Housing. And so we have Lee and and you, is your colleague with us today? Yeah, Marikar is here as well, but I'll, I'll get us started. Thank you so much. I'll just share my screen. Bear, bear with me for one moment here. There we go. Are you seeing the slides? Yes. Great. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here today to present to this group. My name is Lee Grenis, and I'm the Acting Director of Sustainability and Resilience at BC Housing. Really glad to be here today to talk about extreme heat. Um, I know this is an increasingly important topic as our climate continues to warm. And I'm presenting today with my colleague, Marikar Angelis, and I will be covering sort of a high-level overview of BC Housing Areas of Activity on Extreme Heat, and then I'll turn it over to Marikar to speak about the work BC Housing does um, and our health services team does with to support individuals who live in BC Housing directly managed buildings. So I just wanted to start by um, acknowledging that BC Housing does our work on the unceded traditional and ancestral homelands of hundreds of Indigenous peoples and nations across Canada. And I'm joining today from the territory of the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation communities. So here's a quick outline. Um, I will do an intro to BC Housing, um, how we're currently responding to extreme heat, our different areas of activity, and then I'll turn it over to Marikar. So for those who don't know, a quick overview of BC Housing, our Crown Agency, formerly known as the BC Housing Management Commission. We fulfill the directives of the Ministry of Housing, and we receive those directives through an annual mandate letter. And we do have a property um, ownership arm as well. It's the Provincial Rental Housing Corporation that owns a number of community housing buildings across the province. And really we work with municipalities and other municipalities or and other partners to create affordable housing, create developments that are financially um, and environmentally sustainable. And I would say increasingly, um, we need to be creating developments that are resilient to climate change as well. And we ensure consistency with regional and community priorities. A list of our partners here I, on the left, I won't go over them all, but we do work with over 800 housing providers across the province. And we serve people in a, from a variety of um, different groups. And I won't read through the list as well, but I would say that some, most of the people that we work with are at some level of risk from extreme heat, um, it may be due to health conditions or lack of access to cooling or other characteristics. So BC Housing has been thinking about extreme heat for a number of years, but for us, the 2021 heat dome was really a wake up call. It, and in, in response to that event, um, BC Housing developed an extreme heat and wildfire smoke action plan and laid out activities that we needed to work on in five different areas that you see here on the slides. And I'll just touch briefly on what we've been doing in each of these areas. So one of the areas is increasing capacity within the nonprofit housing sector to assist in responding to extreme heat and wildfire smoke. So in 2022, we worked with the BC Nonprofit Housing Association to conduct a survey around extreme heat um, with nonprofit housing providers. And we had over 150 non profit housing providers across the province complete the survey. And we're really looking to see what would help the nonprofit housing sector in responding to extreme heat and what, what they felt their level of preparedness was. And so some common themes that we saw were that nonprofits um, really preferred to be able to purchase items directly to assist with responding to extreme heat. So things like fans, um, air conditioning units for common spaces, water if required, or different items and equipment, whereas prior we had been purchasing those items, um, BC Housing had been purchasing those items and then shipping them across the province, which wasn't really an effective way to respond. So 
We took that feedback and have been working um, to fund nonprofit housing providers when required to purchase those extra supplies that can help them keep their tenants safe. And at the time of the survey, 38% of respondents identified that they didn't have a plan in place for extreme heat for summer 2022, and that they felt that sample response plans, templates, different health, health info um, would assist them in developing those plans. So as a result of the survey, we've been collaborating clo closely with various health authorities, including, including Fraser Health and the BC Nonprofit Housing Authority, or organization to deliver education to the nonprofit housing sector through webinars um, that we've hosted. We hosted one a couple of weeks ago with the BCNPHA. We've been attending the BCNPHA rent events that are conferences um, in different regions around the province and presenting on different templates and ways that nonprofit housing providers could set up response plans. We've developed tools and templates that are available on our web website. Um, and we've communicated with nonprofit housing providers funded by BC Housing that they can request additional funding support for fans or other equipment if required. This is a screenshot of our website um, dedicated to extreme heat and wildfire smoke, where we share those templates and links to different um, sources of information that might, might be helpful. We have a web page about how to cool a space. Um, Something that we do in our directly managed buildings is set up a, a chill room or cooling zone where residents can go if they need to escape the heat. So we have directions on that. We also have uh, sample materials that organizations can download and use themselves. So this here on the left is um, a downloadable poster that can be posted in a building um, with tips to beat the heat for residents. And on the right, that's a tenant response card that has the same information and could be dropped off at a tenant's store. Uh, the next area of activity is building our own organizational capacity within BC Housing to respond to extreme heat um, as well. As, so it was something, extreme heat was something that our operations folks have been thinking about for a while prior to the heat dome and our sustainability team as well, but we didn't have a consistent response across the organization. So last year, we did a lot of work to clarify roles and responsibilities, communication channels out to nonprofit partners and internally within the organization. Something that really helped us with that is we conducted a tabletop exercise last year where we brought together staff from across the organization and walked through what we would each do in the event of an extreme heat alert, just to clarify who would be doing what. We also have um, internal webinars we host for staff on extreme heat and we post education on our internet. And we've worked to update our protocols um, in our directly managed housing based on the most up-to-date information from health authorities on wellness check protocols. I know Marikar is gonna speak a little bit more about that. Another area where we're doing some work is um, reducing the risk of overheating for both new construction of community housing and in the existing building stock. Um, so there's a very large portfolio of community housing in BC and much was built at a time when cooling was not a consideration. So there is a lot of work to do there to bring those buildings um, up to date. So we've been looking at our new construction, which is which complies Buildings funded by BC Housing are supposed to comply to our design guidelines and construction standards. So we have done quite a bit of work to bring those up to date, set limits on the overheating hours that new construction can hit in a specific time period and specify that mechanical cooling is a requirement if the modeling shows that the building will overheat. Um, for all, and in addition, we have specified that for all BC housing buildings, um, we shall not exceed 20 hours of overheating per year, and they must adhere as well to the City of Vancouver energy modeling guidelines. And we're looking also for new construction to use future climate files, not the past climate files as they have done uh, before in modeling, and make some adjustments to improve the air quality in the buildings as well. Secondly, we're looking into building upgrades and retrofits. We do have a facility condition index and prioritize um, upgrades and retrofits based on that matrix. We've current, recently assigned cooling a higher priority on that matrix and looking at ways to incorporate it into projects where it makes sense. 
We're looking at different passive cooling options as well. Um, window film was installed at a number of our housing sites. And this is an application of film that goes on the outside of a window and reduces the solar heat gain inside the units. It's been shown to reduce maximum temperatures in units by a couple of degrees. So it's not as impactful as mechanical cooling, but it definitely reduces the need for cooling in those units. And we've been exploring different external shading options as well that go on the outside of the building and stop that heat gain from entering the units. Our next area of activity is um, research and education. And we've been partnering with different academic institutions, looking at um, different research projects that can help with reducing heating in units. So we partnered most recently last year with the University of Waterloo. And they were looking at the indoor temperature in community housing units. And I think not surprisingly, finding that indoor temperatures can be much higher than those outside. And while alerts are based on the outdoor temperatures, those indoor temperatures can be higher. And I think Amy had a slide that showed that it takes a lot longer for them to cool down, longer to cool down inside than the outside temperatures as well. So they can remain hot even after an alert has passed. We're currently also developing and implementing an engagement plan with tenants and community housing to get feedback on the support that BC Housing has been providing and also their experience of extreme heat, extreme weather events, and what other supports would be helpful as we go through the summer. And lastly, um, we have an ongoing MBAR research project, which stands for Mobilizing Building Adaptation and Resilience, and that's really with industry partners um, as well to pilot different resiliency measures. So it's not limited to extreme heat, but that is um, one big branch of the work as well. And finally, in all these areas, we are collaborating with stakeholders and partners. And so for the last few years, we've been participating on the BC Heat Coordinating Committee. We have an ongoing collaboration with the city of Vancouver where we share ideas and our activities in Vancouver to ensure there isn't too much overlap in our efforts and that we haven't missed anything and engagement with other municipalities as they approach us or as we connect with them. We find these collaborations are very helpful and often spark new ideas and approaches. I'll just finish with one idea that came out of a collaboration with the city of Vancouver. So in 2022, they shared their work on cooling kits, which are simple kits that include um, items that can help individuals cool their bodies during extreme heat. And our last year, our operations team decided to try putting together these kits for tenants living in BC housing directly managed buildings. And the kits include items such as a Rubbermaid tote to use as a cold foot bath, which can really help cool, cool an individual quite quickly. Cold packs and cooling towels that can be used to apply to the body and bring down the temperature. Um, an indoor thermometer to help people be aware of how hot it is in their unit and then reusable water bottles to help them hydrate often. And usually we include an information sheet as well on how to use the cooling kit. And the response we received from our tenants and clients was very positive and we'll be expanding this program um, in 2023. That's all I have and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mary Carr now, stop sharing my slides. Thanks, Lee. I'm just going to quickly pull up my slides. So hi, everybody. My name is Mara Car Angelis. I'm a housing and health nurse uh, with our Lower Mainland Directly Managed team. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I have the privilege today to be presenting from the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, so thank you for having me today. I will be spending some time talking about our wellness check uh, protocol and how we support vulnerable tenants in our directly managed sites. So a quick agenda, um, I'll cover vulnerable populations, who we identify as most at risk and our process for that. I'll cover our wellness check protocol and then talk about ways that we supported tenants during extreme heat events, and then some changes uh, that we're implementing for 2023. So vulnerable populations, um, these risk factors were covered in earlier slides. Uh, so we do use the Vancouver Coastal Heat Check in support frameworks uh, to guide our process. 
So during our preparation phase in the month of March, all of our directly managed sites, um, we come together as a pod. Um, so we have our housing and health coordinators, nurses, tenant support workers, property managers, building managers, all of the frontline staff who have that understanding and interactions with our tenants. Um, and we look at these risk factors, uh, both demographics and environmental, and we are looking to identify folks that meet multiple risk factors. So we go through our entire tenant base um, and we tentatively uh, compile a list of folks who may be vulnerable. And then in April, um, our housing and health services team reaches out individually to each tenant uh, to confirm if they would like to be part of our wellness check-in um, protocol in the event of an extreme heat event. So this slide is an example of the template that we use for documenting our wellness check protocol. Uh, so each site will have its own spreadsheet um, depending on the site and we'll have the list of tenants who we've identified as vulnerable, those who have agreed to be contacted. We'll have pertinent information, uh, their full name, address, unit number, contact information, um, any relevant contact information for supports, uh, whether that's family, um, health teams, uh, neighbors, those who would have regular check-ins with that tenant. Um, and then the dates one, two, and three would be the outcomes of our interactions with tenants during an extreme heat event. Um, and then we would document concisely what the outcome was, if that person is doing okay, if they're well supported, if there's further follow-up that's needed. So we, we do have more sites to cover than staff that are working. So we do try to keep our uh, documentation and notes consistent so that anyone can step in and pick, off, pick up where the, the last person left off. So for our wellness check protocol, um, for our lower mainland team, uh, this is our general protocol. So when BC heat alert response system issues an extreme heat warning, our health services team uh, prepares to conduct our wellness check. So on day two of the extreme heat warning, staff will initiate contact with tenants who have been identified and are on those lists, either by telephone call or in-person checks. So we have a combination of our team uh, stationed at sites, as well as those who are making phone calls. Um, and we strive to do two contacts in a day. Um, the second call is if the person needs or wants that second follow-up. Um, but really we're checking in with the tenant to see how they're managing. We can offer a fan if they need, um, if they need further support um, and really assessing what, um, how they're managing uh, in the heat. And if we aren't able to reach tenants by phone or door knocks, um, we do contact their uh, next of kin or authorized contacts that we have on file to hopefully have someone that has made contact with that person. And then if we still aren't able to reach the tenant or their authorized contacts, we do um, go to the person's door, we'll do a door knock, and if they're not home, we'll post a tenant notification. So that was that tenant response card that Lee had um, shown earlier. And then um, if we would follow up the, the next day and if the tenant notification was still posted, uh, no one's answering the door, we do have the capacity to run a FOB check. Um, so if the person hasn't used their FOB in 48 hours, our next step would be to call emergency services to request a wellness check. So these are examples of questions that we would ask tenants during our check-ins. Um, this gives us good information about how comfortable or distressed they are, um, if they are aware of resources, both on site. Um, a lot of our sites have those chill rooms. We have misting stations. And if those aren't available on site, we want to assess if the person knows of local community resources where they can access cooling spaces. Um, we're also looking to see how the physical unit is, if they have a fan or AC and then also the supports uh, that they have in place who may be uh, checking in with them regularly. So this was covered um, by Lee. So this again is our template for the tenant response card. So when we aren't able to reach somebody in person or by phone, this is what we would post on their door. 
So in our follow-up, um, if they've taken it down and they still haven't reached out to us, that at least gives us an indication that they're okay, um, that they've got some information on tips to stay cool in the heat. So next I will talk about how uh, our team has supported tenants during extreme heat events. So these are uh, photographs that we um, had from last year's extreme heat responses. Uh, so the top left photo there, um, in our preparation phases before the summer months, our health services team um, puts together information sessions uh, for tenants and we had giveaways like spray bottles, indoor thermometers, um, and then we had the information sheets um, to provide that education piece for folks on how to recognize signs and symptoms of heat-related illness, tips to stay cool, and then at the same time, we're promoting that chill room that they can access in the summer months. So our team um, also provided food and beverage to try to entice people to attend these events. Um, and then we also advertise that the chill room spaces are pet friendly. A lot of our tenants have um, pets. So with that knowledge, they aren't feeling like they have to leave their, their pet at home. And then the bottom right um, are the cooling kits. Uh, so Lee talked about the contents of these kits. So last summer, our health services team um, assembled 2,500 kits and delivered them to the tenants that were identified on the vulnerable tenant list. Um, again, the, the feedback was quite positive. Um, so this is something that we will be doing again this year. So some learnings and challenges um, from last year and what we're doing differently this year. Um, in the summer months, we're often working with low, unpredictable staffing numbers. Um, the heat warnings come, I mean, you can kind of see it coming, but uh, we have a lot of staff who are off on vacation um, during the summer months. So we have uh, decreased staffing numbers. Um, we had last summer, I think, three heat warnings that we um, worked through and that, you know, we were seeing a lot of tenants over the number of heat responses become a bit fatigued with the process. Um, I think some of them are feeling oversaturated with the information and the check-ins. Um, so really finding that balance of providing that support to tenants and respecting their uh, choice to be a part of that process. And then another challenge or gap that we identified. Um, so at the end of last summer, uh, tenant surveys were sent out uh, to all of our folks in directly managed sites to evaluate our heat response, um, identify gaps on ways to improve for the following years. And a lot of our time is spent um, focusing and supporting folks who are elderly, isolated. Um, we didn't really focus a lot on the families. Um, so this was something that came about or came out of our tenant surveys. So ways that we will be addressing uh, some of the challenges this year. Um, BC Housing has sent out a letter to all of our tenants in our directly managed sites um, with a voluntary enrollment form. So the letter identifies what our process is um, and then tenants have that uh, choice to say yes or no that they would like to be contacted during an extreme heat event. Um, so we anticipate that our number of folks that will be contacting or checking in on during an extreme heat event may increase this year. Um, and then lastly, we do have increased support uh, this summer for our phone check-ins. So we are very happy to have support from our applicant services team uh, to help our health services staff conduct those uh, check-ins um, to allow us you know, more capacity to reach the tenants at our sites. So that's it for me. Uh, feel free to pop in any questions for Lee or I in the chat, um, and I will pass it over to Holly from Mosaic. Thank you. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start my screen share here. So hopefully everybody can see that all right. So yes, my name is Holly Jones and I am the volunteer resources coordinator for Mosaic. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Mosaic, 
we are supporting newcomers and immigrants with settlement services as well as employment services. And we are one of the larger uh, settlement agencies within the region as well as within Canada. So we looked at <laughs> what was being done by other organizations and looking at what it is that Mosaic does really well. And for us, you know, we have the language capacity for supporting persons who quite often may go unsupported through language barriers. So with this, with the United Way's funding, we were able to create our Mosaic Multilingual Emergency Preparedness Support Program, <laughs> which I know is a mouthful. Um, but that gives you sort of the essence of what our focus is for what we're working on. So as Mosaic, we are honored and privileged to be permitted to live, work, and play on the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Quaycott, Sawasan, Quiquitlam, Katsi, Kwantlen, <laughs> Semiamu, and Matsque Nations. And so Mosaic does have staff and or offices throughout the region. Uh, as far out as Chilliwack with our employment services currently. So we are introducing, of course, these emergency support supports uh, for seniors. And these are seniors whose first language is not uh, English or French because those uh, persons are more supported by most of our other organizations throughout the region and materials and resources and information is uh, ad adequately, you know, being provided in those core link, those two primary languages. So our demographic currently is 65 or older, living alone or with a partner, so independently, and that their preferred language is something other than English or French. Of course, this isn't, you know, a hard line. Um, we do have flexibility as well. So if there is somebody in need uh, that falls, you know, within similar demographics uh, and the language need is there, then we can certainly discuss if we would be able to add them to our list. So we are working uh, in partnership with the Burnaby Community uh, Network, as well as I've with Fraser Health and Coastal Health to develop the calling script and take that from where it had been previously. And thank you to Michelle and her team at Burnaby Citizen Support for sharing their information and all of that and their experience from last year to help us work all together to develop this into an even better uh, tool and resource for everybody. So our team is currently working on revising the calling script, which is a script this year, and making it so that it will be accessible for low level English users. So ideally, we would love to get it translated into multiple languages uh, that at the moment we um, at the moment we don't have the funds for that. So if funding comes available, then that is the, would be the next phase would be translation. We're also having along with the calling script is a PowerPoint training, sort of train the, train the caller for low level English call providers. So this means when we say low level, that means that it's accessible to anybody who is as we're looking at a CLB or link level three English or higher. So to make it accessible to as many people as possible, we're looking at having the communication and the language able to be understood by anybody from that level or higher. We're also developing uh, training e-learning modules that we'll, we will be using in our Better Impact volunteer database. And those modules will be able to be shared with other organizations uh, throughout the region and the province who might be wanting to you know, maybe use some of that um, as well, because of course, nobody has the time or resources to duplicate eff uh, efforts. So those will, we will be able to work with you to help make those available. 
as well. The script and uh, the PowerPoint presentation will be uh, will be able to be shared amongst other users throughout the region and further afield. So currently our planned area of support is Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, Tri-Cities, uh, Surrey, Langley, Richmond, Fraser Valley. Um, we've been asked if we can cover as far out as Abbotsford. So we are looking at what that will um, entail for, for our team. And our, our call tape makers, will be volunteers. So because of that and our specialty with languages supporting underserved populations, currently we have plans for Mandarin and Cantonese, Farsi, Dari, Pashto, Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, Tagalog, Punjabi, Hindi, Tigrinya, um, as well as, as our, our list grows and um, additional language needs are, are identified, then we'll be able to um, work on engaging volunteers to support in those languages, if at all possible as well. So we have our first language pre-event preparedness information calls. So checking in with the registrants prior to the events, to help provide them the information as much as we can with, so that they can prepare themselves. So if they don't already have access to a cooling kit or have that information that they'll be, cooling kit information will be shared. The safe use of fans, tips that they can take themselves for uh, cooling their spaces and uh, advising them about as well, speaking with their medical professional team or their pharmacist or calling 811 to discuss if they do have medical conditions or um, medications that they may be on that they would need to speak to a health professional about, because that is definitely outside of the scope of our volunteers. And then during the events themselves, we will be providing those first language wellness check-in calls uh, throughout the, the event itself, as well as the days preceding. Until, until the the um the client actually tells to us, you know, I feel comfortable now. My place is cool enough because we understand that our clients are in a vast variety of accommodations and locations. So what we're not providing as Mosaic is we're not able to provide, of course, transportation or cooling kits and supplies. So we're we are focusing on the communication to get those people who are have English and as a language barrier to make sure that they have access to the information. We will have volunteers helping uh, keep updated information on the various communities that we have clients being supported in. And they will be then provided the information specific to their location for what cooling centers are available and what transportation options are available within their community. So we'll be doing our best to make sure that we're able to keep those up to date as best as possible. So if you're a key person who will be having that type of information, I would love to connect with you uh, so that we can collaborate on the flow of communications and information. So we are accepting referrals, as self-referrals and uh, professional and assisted referrals from the community to for our uh, language supports. So if you have a client and because there are many organizations and groups doing the calls and but not everybody has every language available, then that's somewhere that we can work together and partner with you to support your clients that maybe you're not able to support as well with uh, the language capacity. So that's where we're able to come and help step in and fill those gaps in the systems currently to help make sure that information is available to those individuals who really do need access to it and don't have access to our usual means of communication and have the language barrier. So this QR code, you're welcome to scan that now. That'll take you to the, uh, the referral 
form and uh, I and that said it's <laughs> for me self referral or as well um, somebody you could assist somebody to to refer them for uh, for the service as well. And if you'd like to connect with me directly uh, to speak about the tools and resources we're creating and working on, then please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, I can be reached at volunteer at mosaicbc.org and uh, we'll get one of us will get back to you as quickly as we can. We are a small team of staff and we rely on our, our incredible volunteers. Many of our volunteer, majority of our volunteers, pardon me, are newcomers themselves and immigrants. So they're bringing their gifts and skills of language to help make uh, our communities safer for uh, all members of our communities. So that's everything that I have for today day. So I'm sure there, I see there's some new questions appear to have come in. So definitely we'll be happy to, to talk through any questions that you may have. Um, and, and we'll be able to figure out how we can work together. So thanks everybody. Thanks so much, Holly. Thank you so much to our presenters today. Uh, I'm very excited about the work that everyone is doing. So we're going to move into our Q&A session now. Um, we're going to go by which have been up, uh, most upvoted, but I want to assure everybody that we will um, get to answering all the questions. If we can't do it in this session, we will send out the Q&A uh, package afterwards, and then we will be able to download um, the, the questions and answers to share out afterwards so everyone can have that uh, ready at their fingertips. Um, so our first question is, um, unfortunately, cool and clean air spaces in community are not typically welcoming or comfortable for unsheltered individuals. This makes it very challenging to support community members when heat or smoke events occur. Um, I guess I'm just looking for feedback if folks have ideas on how to address this gap. I don't know if there's anyone on the team that would like to take that one. I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Emily Newhouse. I'm medical health officer with Fraser Health. And we certainly do recognize this is a challenge. Um, we know that there's confusion sometimes about who these shelters are for, um, because of course there are different audiences that, that we're hoping that can make their way to, to cool and clean air shelters. And we certainly have emphasized this in our communications about best practices in cooling centers, um, ensuring that they're welcome to people of all income levels and backgrounds. That's really critical for making sure that they meet their intended purposes. Um, we've also um, done some communications out to businesses as well, because we recognize that um, businesses run a lot of spaces that have cool and clean air um, and encouraging them to prioritize the safety of their community by ensuring that, that everyone feels welcome. But I know it's a challenging issue and I think um, it really probably takes a collaborative approach for um, a lot of a, a lot of different organizations and partners giving the same message and us working to uh, better understand some of the barriers that um, that we hear about um, that make it um, that makes some organizations less inclined to be welcoming so I think we're continuing to to gather information from various partners on, on their experience of cooling centers and clean air shelters and um, what what aspects they've had that made that successful and where we hear that feedback we're trying to communicate it out but I certainly um, if there are best practices that your organization is familiar with um, would would certainly love to hear that um, and I see it looks like Ryan are you um, are you looking to answer this question too not sparking it off thank you oh okay I see you I see you. thanks um, and maybe for the sake of time um, is it okay Amy if I if I try to to talk, speak to a couple other questions as well. Sure, please. Okay. So, um, uh, how to make a, how can we make a plan to implement on farms to help temporary migrant workers that have to work longer hours um, during the day? Yeah, we certainly recognize that that workers may be some of the most susceptible populations for heat. Um, we've been having conversations with uh, Worth WorkSafe BC. Um, you know, when we think about making heat plans, there's of course different. Uh, we can be targeting communications to workers and also to employers. So WorkSafe BC does have. Um, requirements for uh, workplaces, and that includes workplaces with temporary uh, migrant workers. Um, 
and requirements for them to have heat plans. And we, we have been working with them this year to develop um, resources. One of the challenges that we learned about is that it, it can actually be very complex to meet the requirements. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can monitor whether workers are safe, lots of different equipment that's needed. Um, so when we looked to create kind of simple communications about this for, for workplaces, we found it was actually quite tricky. Um, but what we would encourage is that um, where workers are concerned um, that they um, may be able to contact WorkSafe BC or ask their employers for what their heat plan is. Um, employers are required to have a heat plan. Um, we also have been developing um, simpler resources that help workers to understand if they're safe during the day, highlighting that you know if they have accommodations, those need to be those um, need to be safe as well, and some of the factors that might um, determine whether they're um, whether they're safe, and giving some ways they can monitor that, like whether they're taking enough breaks, whether they have access to water, um, whether some signs from their body indicate they're getting overheated. So I think the that the workplace safety is a fairly complex issue, and I know uh, we're, our hope is that in future years that we have more resources available and I know WorkSafe is doing the same. So I would say if your um, WorkSafe BC would be a key resource, we can give some sort of key recommendations. And if you want to kind of talk to us afterwards and, and we can share what we've been working on, I'm happy to do that. Uh, um, on to the next one, the question about, can you speak to the heat index considerations for how temperatures might be experiencing, like the feel like temperature as opposed to the actual temperature, especially for vulnerable populations, similar to how wind chill factors are considered in the winter. This, this question is, is, is absolutely right. Um, we know that the impacts of heat are different Usually based on humidity is the most important factor. Of course, wind can play a bit of a role as well um, if someone's outdoors, but humidity probably the most important. And the reason why we've stuck to using temperatures is because we realize that most people don't have the equipment to measure humidity in their homes. Um, and for other individuals who are trying to make decisions that again, they're not likely to have the equipment uh, and it's kind of harder, it's, it's a more complex um, concepts to start using kind of wet bulb temperatures. So for that reason, we have focused on temperatures. Um, we know that's not the full story. Um, one thing that is fortunate um, in BC is that we tend to have lower levels of humidity. So for us, um, it the it's, using the temperature alone um, is not a, you know, as, as bad as you might think, especially compared to other locations, but certainly consideration of humidity is really important. That's actually one of the reasons why we don't recommend using a lot of misting type equipment in, indoors is because there is a risk of that increasing the humidity substantially. Um, we do recommend use of some of those misting um, misting tents and that sort of thing outside where we know that there's enough um, airflow that it was not going to result in a significant increase in humidity, but it's certainly a, an important consideration for planning. And two more minutes, so I'll try to get to the other ones that have three, but I, if other folks want to jump in here, I, I can, uh, Amy, we, did we, you... actually, we actually have till 1130, Emily. Oh, we have to, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll just pause uh, pause there then um, to see if those answers were clear, um, and I'll stop rushing. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I, I might actually, well, well, folks are thinking I might just add. You know, I think we've when it comes to the humid X and, and feels like, you know, there are certain temperatures where you know that's the criteria, but also. If you're hearing from the folks that you support that they need help um, activating, yeah, um, activating your plans is also is always a good idea. And one more comment on the humidity issue. Um, that that is certainly something that you know the HAR system is based on uh, an analysis of mortality data and. So uh, as we continue to improve, that's certainly something that we can look at is you know, whether factoring in humidity would change um, some, of the, some of the predictivity of the alerting system. So um, it's, it certainly is an iterative, like a, an on, we're integrating ongoing improvements. That's great. 
Another question is, um, is there any assistance that could be provided to support requests for temporary water fountains or stations uh, in municipalities that are hesitant to support this option? Um, what I would say is, you know, certainly from the health authorities perspective, we're happy to um, to recommend this and, you know, amplify um, your your messaging if this is something that's needed. Um, this is a recommendation of the HARS system. So um, if you need help communicating that, certainly we're happy to to um, join that conversation. Um, we recognize that um, that just as you know, we we gave the same kind of caveats about resourcing um, and funding. You know, when we talked about some of the act recommended actions here, that we get that same feedback from municipalities that not all of them have the funding or staff or resources to um, put in place certain interventions. So we do try to be mindful of those resource converse those resource questions. Um, but certainly, from a pr perspective of um, whether that's a recommendation or not, we can certainly confirm that 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 those are recommendations. Um, I don't know if there's other um, if there's other uh, resources from the province in terms of financial resources for that specifically. Um, that might be something that we can ask the emergency management and climate resilience folks. I do know that there's funding for like running buildings for longer um, and operating cooling centers, but I have to acknowledge I'm not sure if that there's emergency funding for municipalities for that specific action. Thank you, Emily. Um, the next question is asking for fans, AC units or cooling heating supplies um, should be done ahead of time, uh, not a week prior to the event. Um, how can we move forward on this? We're trying to ask, we're trying to ask for things now um, from what we've learned already, uh, but not hearing back anything from, from the ministry. And I think we have um, put out a few things on our social media to try to help, um, I guess, get the public a little bit more aware of, of starting to invest now where, where possible, understanding that there is some um, economic barriers to, to some of these things, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, the, so what I will share is that one question that has come up is um, whether AC units can be considered medical devices, which does uh, free up several, um, some funding sources. That was a recommendation, I believe, from the coroner um, during their report on, uh, on the extreme heat emergency of 2021. Um, the ministry is currently undergoing review of options for that. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to maybe that, if that may be why um, they're slower to respond because they're still figuring out um, that, that medical device piece. And so there may be still some work that the, I know that the ministry is still kind of looking at that and um, looking at options. So that might be why um, there's less communication so I absolutely, we, just as Amy said, we agree that this needs to, those cooling supplies, um, particularly ones where there may be supply limitations, you know, at any given time, like with air conditioning, um, needs to be a consideration longer ahead of the season. And as Amy said, we're doing, that's one of the reasons why we've been doing some of our public communication actually starting now to encourage folks who um, have the resources to potentially access them to, to look for them now. Um, but I, I would encourage, you know, to keep that conversation going with the ministry, because I do think that they're thinking about it. They just may not have been um, ready to um, commit yet. Thank you, Emily. Uh, our next question is, can fans be used outdoors to move air around? Um, just one, Amy, that I'm seeing that I think is above. Oh, and sorry. I might, um, about accessing funding to gather resources if planning to host a cooling center this summer. So my understanding um, of the of the funding landscape, and and this is not my total area of expertise. So so if anyone knows something different, again, again please um please correct me. But my understanding of of the way the funding has been arranged is that there is uh, funding from the province of BC from um, from what used to be called Emergency Management BC 
now its name is uh, changed to Emergency Management and Climate Resilience. And they have funding that's available for running uh, cooling centers during heat event, but that funding is available to municipalities and so, uh, and not directly to community organizations. Uh, so I, again, not being an expert on how that funding landscape works, you know, one of the things I'm curious about is whether it's possible to partner with municipalities um, to be able to um, be a, you know, a service more of a service delivery mechanism for the municipality and so that the funding could be accessed through the municipality. But, oh, Scott, I see Scott raising your hand. So Scott, please give me the correct answer. <laughs> uh, I, I can't give you the absolute correct answer, but I can say that my understanding is, is that EMCR um, provides the direct funding to local governments and First Nations and that um, those local governments and First Nations can reach partnerships with other agencies so the funding stream is essentially from an NGO, as an example, to the local government. The local government then submits on behalf of that NGO to the ministry and then receives the funding. So they are an in-between uh, on the funding and the agreement would have to be between that agency and the local government in order to receive the funding. So it does add some complexity and I have heard from some of my colleagues in local government that those are headaches that they don't necessarily want to take. So as many of you who've worked with local governments probably know, some some groups will be very willing to step into that space and others might not. Um, but my understanding is, is that there is funding and there is opportunities for engagement through local governments and First Nations. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you, Scott. One other thing I'll highlight, and I don't like I and I know the funding stream, this funding stream is not necessarily a large grant for any one organization, but there are other grants available. Um, uh, Amy, maybe uh, the United Way grant. Um, I don't know if you have the details on that one. Um, I don't have a United Way grant, but I, I know there's a UBCM grant. Oh, OK, uh, that's must be what I'm thinking of. Yeah, uh, there's a UBCM grant, I think, for municipalities to partner with. Um, nonprofit organizations in the community come up with heat plans. And I think there's some, I'm not sure if there's supplies that are, are connected to that, but that I believe that that is still open. Yeah, so some, some other funding streams too. Um, the next question is, can fans be used outdoors to move air around? Uh, yes. So um, as, as, um, as you know, there's some tricky concepts with fans. So uh, fans typically don't um, cool our bodies down significantly uh, if, they're, if we're um, a highly susceptible population or if the temperatures are really high. Um, so where we do, but, Fans can be used, for example, when we talked about uh, a little bit about misting tents, they can be used to distribute some of that, um, to distribute some of that misting around and then it evaporates and creates a slightly cooler environment. So fans can be used um, outdoors for that kind of purpose. Um, we don't recommend fans as much for direct cooling of the body. And in fact, if the temperature is really hot, say, you know, 35 degrees or over, it can actually be risky um, because as soon as someone has absorbed the air, the, the heat from the air right next to their body, a fan blows new hot air right next to their body. So we actually don't recommend using fans in temperatures um, that are that hot. So yes, fans can be used outdoors, um, but really with a caveat, like with a, our, our primary recommendation is kind of dispersing cooler air around, like using fans to move cooler air, you know, outdoors to indoors, for example. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, I'm just wanting to ensure that I'm seeing the ones that are being upvoted, but uh, I believe the next one is to ensure that we're not to ensure that we're not doubling up on who's calling. As we know, resources are thin. Is there a way to know who in BC housing, who BC housing is calling? Uh, I know confidentiality is a concern, but we need to be efficient. Um, I might ask if, if there's any information from BC House on, on this one. 
Sure, I can take this question. Um, so during our preparation phase, when we're reaching out to tenants to ask if they'd like to be a part of our wellness check um, procedure, we do ask if they are connected to any supports in the community. Um, and if they do let us know that they've got a care team, um, home health, mental health team, our staff do try to reach out to those um, supports in the community to confirm um, what their process is during extreme heat events, um, just to avoid that duplication of work. Um, but another way that uh, you could see if your client um, is being checked in by BC Housing is to ask if they've received that letter. So if they are a, a tenant at one of our directly managed sites, they would have received the letter with the voluntary enrollment form. So if they've agreed to be a part of that, that would be one way to know that we're checking in on them. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, I've heard regist about registries that vulnerable uh, and isolated individuals can opt into for wellness checks or prioritized response. Do either of the health authorities have more information on this? Also great work by the presenters and organization. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, what, what, um, there are a couple different initiatives going on at the health authorities and at the ministry as well that I'll highlight. So in addition to some of the work done by all of the amazing, um, nonprofits, um, the, the health authorities also are doing specific work on their on certain client populations that they're engaged with already. So for example, our home health teams uh, are identifying folks who uh, need wellness checks or prioritize response um, during heat events, and they are keeping track of those and have plans for outreach to those. So for specific populations where they're regular clients of the health authority, they're, they're uh, they will, they will be having an assessment of their vulnerability. So for the home health program and um, to, uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not as familiar with them, mental health and substance use programs, I know they're considering that as well, but I can't confirm um, how far they've gotten in their planning for that, um, those checks. The other thing I'll mention is that uh, at a provincial level, uh, this is something that the province is looking at. Uh, there are, as sort of the last question alluded to, there are privacy considerations. And so it's it's a bit of a longer planning process, but I know that this is something that there's thought being put to at the provincial level of how we can uh, um, kind of surmount some of those privacy concerns and have folks opt into um, being identified in a registry. So uh, I, think I think the answer on that is stay tuned. Thanks so much, Emily. And, and I think there's also a program, um, it's not, the health authorities per se, but there is a program where um, different um, physicians are are being supported to look at their client roster and see who might be um, who may be vulnerable in extreme heat situation. Um, if they want to do some uh, some outreach to those populations, but I'm not sure how far along that pro program is. Or uh, and I know that the capacity for doing the check ins has been flagged as an issue in the past. So that, that's another program that's that's happening, but not necessarily in conjunction with um, with the health authorities per se. So our next question is um, just a note uh, for offering outdoor cooling sites to people experiencing homelessness. Oh, sorry, that's that's a helpful comment, but it's not a question. Um, <laughs> Um, maybe I can offer one comment on that, Amy. Please. Um, so the, uh, the um, Karen commented that we found that when we had one day of high pollution in 2021, people were reluctant or refused to go to new resources. They wanted to stay where they felt comfortable with no st stigma dedicated for people who are marginalized due to this discrimination they experience in public spaces. The people running cooling centers need to be community-based. I really appreciate this comment. And we've been thinking about this idea a lot of really not necessarily designing all new cooling or clean air spaces, but really trying to ensure that the spaces that people are already spending time are um, are outfitted to keep people safe. Um, we recognize that people don't necessarily wanna go to a new space 
even if it, the stigma is not an issue, it, if a space that, that feels unfamiliar where they're not sure what they're going to do, where they just kind of feel like they're waiting the day away, people aren't necessarily going to want to to spend time in those spaces for a really long period of time. And, and in order to stay cool, you have to, as Amy mentioned, it takes a really long time to cool down once you're overheated and you do need to st stay for a long time. So I think that is something that's on our minds. The idea that we really want to build up all of these different spaces in our community where people already feel welcome and comfortable and happy to spend time and make sure those places are cool and have clean air. And that's another reason why we're promoting um, some of the DIY air filters, um, which we just touched on briefly during the presentation, but um, it's, we know retrofitting spaces for, um, for you know, HVAC systems is, is challenging, um, but creating DIY air filters is actually surprisingly effective. Um, there's, as we talked about, it's, there's instructions on um, BCCDC's website for doing that, um, and it can be really helpful in creating clean air. So thinking about how we can make spaces that already exist safe um, is we think is maybe going to be a more effective way than trying to create big new resources that people may not be inclined to go to. Great question. Thank you so much. Um, the next one is um, funding is needed for resources to buy um, air conditioners for drop-ins and resources that people for people who experience homelessness. Oh, sorry, sorry, Emily, you read that. No, already. that I I, I'm it. reading it too, and um, it sounds like an, uh, another comment. But yes, agreed um, that um, that resources for updating spaces is an important is an important need. That um, that we all can highlight. Very much so, and I think um, just to highlight one of the pieces that the city of Burnaby uh, last year did a couple of open houses preseason to to let people know that if there is a heat event, like where they were going to be putting up uh, cooling shelters. So any anyone that is putting up a cooling shelter being or is hoping to or planning to during these events, you know, advertising that beforehand is, is helpful as well. The next question is, can you share with us any resources for funds, grants for AC units and cooling kits, et cetera, to give out to people? It's a nonprofit, we could use funds. I'm not sure if those UBCM grants would cover those materials. Amy, do you have a sense? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, to, to be honest. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. There, I also wonder if there might be anything through the um, actually, I'm just going to go take a quick look through, uh, I think, BC Healthy Living. Okay, while Amy does that, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll um, talk to some of the other questions. Some of the smaller, older, the older, smaller rental units, if closed up, the heat increases significantly. That caused some of the emergency crisis we dealt in 2021, particularly. So, um, I, what I, I think this question is getting at the the issue of, of closing doors and windows. <clears throat> and this is a little bit of a complicated recommendation. So, um, I, and I know it can be a little confusing. When we, we recommend that um, temperature, that windows and blinds be closed during the days when uh, the heat is higher outside than inside, because as long, you know, it's it's sort of, it feels a little bit counterintuitive because you always want to feel that breeze from outside. But when it's hotter outside than inside, um, that is letting hot air exchange with the cooler air inside. Um, at, in the evening, in the early morning and overnight is when um, windows should be open um, to, uh, to ensure um, that, that, yeah, that cool air is opened. And we, and we did highlight some, some safety issues that sometimes that can happen with windows in particular. And so um, one of the, um, one of the safety recommendations for, for some that we recommend is installing some of those window guards so that they can have um, open windows during those times, but not worry about people falling. So yeah, I know it's a little bit, of, it just does feel a little bit counterintuitive to keep things closed during the day um, when it's hotter outside than inside, but it does help to keep actually keep things cooler.
Um, Sorry, Emily. Just to yeah, go ahead. Jump in, Amy. Um, I, I haven't been able to find any in the ones that I usually look for, but um, I can do a little bit more digging after our after our session and, and see if there's anything. And if so, that we can send those out with the package. Yes, and if any of you any of the organizations in attendance, if you're aware of any granting programs for these materials, um, please do share them with us. And again, we'll we'll, we'll share them out with the group. Um, sorry to interrupt. Just related to that, uh, another participant, Aman, did reply to that. I don't know if you you can see that on your end, but um, they've replied that United Way ha does have some resources, and they're offering to be. If anybody needs more information, they can contact them. Oh, thank you, Prabjeet. I, 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 I thought there was a United Way grab. Um, it was in the back of my mind somewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, is, is anyone helping folks in the privately owned SROs? Uh, I, I, I think that I would say that probably Vancouver Coastal is better positioned to, to speak to this because they have more of these of these buildings than we do in Fraser Health. Not sure if there's anyone from from DCH who can speak to this question. I can speak to some of that. Um, I can't speak to all of the SROs, but I know that there are some um that have sort of community-led programs going on um and i believe some that might be working alongside uh, the city um with some of the cool kit programs um and some of the um like uh community education programs that are going on um i don't know which one specifically but i think that is something that's being looked at um I'm, but i'm not sure to what extent because i think some of that is through the city And Scott. Yeah, I'll just uh, add that within the health authorities themselves are um, patients who are receiving supports in the homes, which might relate to a lot of SROs. Um, we do have plans with our home health teams to identify our higher risk clients and ensure that they're notified and there are increased visits that occur. And in some cases, they might be dropping off cooling kits and, and other types of um, devices. Now, that isn't the larger um, populace of, within the SRO who certainly could be at similar risk, but the the ones that the health system is aware of, there is a process for reaching out to those. And um, the, so there is some activity in this space, but um, not specific to the to the broader kind of uh, building owners and, and folks who live there. Actually, that reminded me as well, like we, I think with, with Fraser as well, um, we've been putting messaging out to uh, building owners and managers about ways they can reduce barriers for folks that are living in buildings. Um, and I think we are applying to, we are expanding that guidance this year to include more information. So, um, and trying to work directly with some of these larger organizations like Landlord BC have been um, pretty proactive about having educational events around this for their members. Um, so we are trying to work alongside those folks as well. Thanks so much, Megan. And Scott and Emily. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so the next question is, the health authorities and other organizations presenting all have a different age demographic they target, 55 plus 60, 65 plus, wondering why the discrepancy. Um, and one of the commenters suggests that there may be some differences between mandates. Um, <clears throat> what I would say is that it's 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 a little bit of a judgment call. When you look at the data um, that looks at health outcomes, what you find is that, especially for the most severe outcomes, there's a, a very kind of strong relationship with age, and it begins around age 50. So we didn't see, uh, uh, I, I, we didn't see, I don't think, any deaths in the extreme heat emergency in folks under age 50. We saw a very few between age 50 and 60, and then it started to climb as you went into some of those older age brackets. So 
it really kind of depends on, you know, how focused you want to be on the absolute highest demographic versus how much you want to include everyone who's at risk of the most serious outcomes. So it's a bit of a judgment call. You know, if an organization wants to have, you know, focused on the absolute highest risk population, they'll focus on, they'll focus on older seniors. And if you want to include everyone who's at risk of death, then you're going to have a broader age bracket. So yeah, what I would say is, you know, for understanding the risk, essentially, um, the risk of death you know, starts in those younger seniors, but it really climbs quickly in old, the in the older the age group you get to. Now, as in, as a, our presenters alluded to earlier, the risk for more moderate heat related outcomes actually are across the age spectrum. So, in more moderate heat events, what we've seen is actually working age, younger and working age populations are some of the more common folks who are visiting the eMERGE. So uh, across the age spectrum, we have risk of more moderate heat outcomes and then really beginning in older adults and climbing as you get older um, is the risk of the most severe outcomes. So I hope that, can, that contextualizes it a bit. Thank you, Emily. There's a question around what options in, what are the options in municipalities who are not interested in mobilizing response or access to funding? Go ahead, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is a great question and a challenging one for sure. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest here that um, the extreme heat emergency, that high level, events that we experienced in 2009 and we experienced more even to a higher degree in 2021, those are unique, singular, and very powerful heat events. We might have municipalities that aren't interested in doing um, collaboration for heat warning levels, those, you know, two to three times per year, but they might be willing to support something for those far less frequent, hopefully, um, five to 10 year frequency events where we see that significant increase in mortality rates. So perhaps you might have a municipality that's not interested in, in collaboration for heat warnings, but um, to present it as it, for extreme heat emergencies, this is an opportunity to have, um, we're, we're pulling out all the stops. We are, we are attempting to do everything we possibly can to protect our, our populace. So you might have groups that would be willing to agree that in extreme heat emergency, they would trigger some relationship with you um, that they they might not be willing to do at that lower level warning. And for example, um, there's some great work being done in this space. Um, the city of New West and Fraser Health's uh, home health program, for example, has set up a um, century house where they're going to be diverting low level 911 calls uh, related to heat and a fire uh, fighter and nurse will be on site providing um, care and, and monitoring of these people as they cool off in that cooling center. So um, while that's not the same kind of relationship as what we're speaking here, it is an example of a collaboration that is being prepared for that extreme heat level and not the lower heat warning level. So that might be a, an opportunity there. Yeah, I think, thanks, Scott. And I think that is actually an, one um, distinction that we've highlighted uh, to, to municipalities is that we expect some moderate health impacts at a heat warning level. We expect the really, really significant uh, mortality at an extreme heat emergency. And so some municipalities are, are integrating that into the, how they're judging their response. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Um, there is a question. Um, it was mentioned in 2022 that younger people were at greater risk um, from heat, extreme heat emergencies. Are we any, aware of any statistics regarding workers and heat stroke? Um, I That's a great, oh, go ahead, Amy. Oh, sorry. Emily. Uh, I was just going to say, um, we do know from WorkSafe BC that um, in 2021, there was um, a 180% increase uh, in heat-related stress um, claims um, compared to the previous four years. 
And I do want to, and I, and, and one thing I will just highlight because I think this is an important distinction. We did see more use of our emergency department by younger people last year, but those were much milder, um, generally much milder presentations than what we saw. So yes, we, you know, our, one of our potential interpretations is that in these more mild heat events, maybe younger people and workers are not necessarily adjusting all of their behaviors. And so they're maybe experiencing milder complications, um, but then in those really severe heat events is when, um, when we see the really severe ones and, and older people affected. So yes, we saw them more affected, but I do wanna emphasize it was less severe. And I think we're just about out of time. I think that United Way grant is still open. I believe so, you have to double check, but I think it's actually open until August maybe. Um, just quickly before we wrap up, um, I believe my colleague at Vancouver Coastal Health, Helenka, um, said she might have an answer to the question around SROs, if we've got a quick second here. Sure, folk, fo folks need to drop off their welcome to, we'll stay for one more minute to, to answer this. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Helenka. I, this is referring back to a question that came a little further back in the conversation, but we um, at Coastal Health, we do have some teams that support clients who are living in SROs. And um, certainly there are plans for those teams, like the overdose outreach team, for example, to review their client load in advance uh, to prepare for a heat emergency and to be doing kind of targeted outreach with clients who are most at risk in advance around education um, to help them stay cool and make sure they know how best to do that and then to support in any way needed in the event of an emergency. So that just adds to our conversation before. I'm sure other folks with um, outreach teams are, are doing similar. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we, we are at time or slightly past time, so we're going to call, call it, I think, but I won't, just want to say thank you so much to our presenters today for, for being with us, to all of you for taking the time out. And, um, you know, please remember that if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I think you have the contact information from our slides. Um, we are available to provide letters of support, consultations, reviewing heat plans, training, presentations, things like that. Um, and so thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today.